The Semper Virens Fund works to conserve redwood forests in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And we acknowledge that these uh, lands were the ancestral homes for many indigenous people, people who cared for them for millennia until they were forcibly removed. And we're grateful today to work with their descendants, including the Amamutsan tribal band and the Mawekma Ohlone tribe to restore their cultural and traditional relationships to these magnificent forests. I know many of you have joined us for these webinars previously or other webinars and are familiar with how these things work. But just to remind you, we do take questions in the chat and in the Q&A section found at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of this webinar. Also, I wanna remind you that this is being recorded. So if you miss some of it, it'll be posted up on our website shortly afterwards and you can see it there. We are here today to talk about puma or mountain lions and maybe one of our questions for Dr. Wilmers ought to be why there's so many different names for this creature, magnificent creature. Um, but before we get to that, I wanna share some exciting and important news with you. And that is that recently Governor Gavin Newsom uh, rolled out his budget proposal for the state and we were delighted and surprised to see uh, the historic amount of funding being recommended for investment in wildfire resilience, wildfire recovery, um, as well as in our state parks budget, both for wildfire recovery specifically in our parks, but also for things like land acquisition to expand the size of our existing parks, create new parks, as well as um, maintenance investment in uh, the maintenance uh, and infrastructure at our parks to deal with some of the aging infrastructure. More investments like this are needed, but we were really heartened. It is a significant down payment. And in particular, a substantial amount of the funding is expected to be earmarked for recovery at Big Basin Redwood State Park, uh, which as many of you know, was destroyed in the recent fires. So we're very excited about that. It, will require the legislature's approval to have that budget be finalized. And so if you live in the state of California and you care about these issues, we urge you to get in touch with your state representative and urge them to uh, support the governor's investment in uh, wildfire recovery and state parks. The consequence of that investment, I think will be both the health and vitality of our forests as well as the associated species that inhabit them, like the mountain lions, um, as well as uh, setting up places that will be enjoyable for all generations and all, all Californians to visit. So to help us understand a bit more about healthy forests and their connection to wildlife, we have asked us uh, we've asked to join us, Dr. Chris Wilmers. He is, uh, in our region at least, the is unequivocally known as the mountain lion expert. Uh, he is a professor of ecology at UC Santa Cruz, and he is also one of the lead researchers with the Puma Project. Um, I'm also delighted to say uh, that he is a member of Semper Viren's science advisory panel, for which we are really grateful to him for his uh, involvement and contributions. So there's a lot to learn about pumas and their needs. One thing we do know is that they need large connected uh, chunks of habitat, healthy habitat. And although Sempervirens has been investing in that effort for a long time, that kind of habitat is hard to come by here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. So we'll, we'll learn more about it. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Wilmers. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. It's uh, a wonderful introduction. And um, let's see, I'm going to just share my screen here. Great. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you all about uh, the research we've been doing on mountain lions in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, before I, I get too far into it, I always like to thank uh, all my collaborators and and folks who've worked on this study, because it's it's really a group effort that I'm presenting here. There's a number of wonderful grad students and postdocs in my lab, a number of other professors and collaborators that have worked with me, a um, number of field biologists that have you know, collected a lot of the data in the field, uh, houndsmen who have helped us um, catch animals so that we can tag them, a uh, pilot, um, an illustrator, and dozens, if not probably hundreds of undergraduate volunteers at this point. 
and then a number of funders and then some wonderful photographers that have uh, shared their images with us. So, you know, when we think of large cats, you know, these are the kinds of images that, that, that they evoke, right? These beautiful creatures living in these pristine environments. And while this is, you know, how we imagine them in our dreams, uh, more and more, this is the reality that these animals are living in, right? As uh, humans encroach on the wild areas that these animals live in, you know, you get scenes like this, uh, leopard in the outskirts of uh, Bombay and or Mumbai in uh, India, uh, African lion on the outskirts of Nairobi and Kenya, and then this uh, sort of now famous mountain lion from Los Angeles, P-22, uh, you know, with the um, uh, LA uh, behind him. So, um, you know, our research here is really trying to understand how people and human development um, influence everything from the behavior and physiology of these animals up to their populations and ecology and and ultimately conservation and management. Um, and so if we think about um, our study area, which is really the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is this you know, big green block here, right? Um, the problem we're really worried about is what ecologists call habitat fragmentation, which is where you take you know, you know, large blocks of habitat and then you start chopping it up um, into smaller blocks separated from, you know, inhospitable areas. And so if you think about the Santa Cruz Mountains, that habitat fragmentation is happening at a couple different scales. It's happening at this large landscape scale where, you know, you've got Highway 17 bisecting the Santa Cruz Mountains in two. You've got Highway 101 and all the development of the Silicon Valley and south separating the Santa Cruz Mountains from the Hamilton Range to the east. You've got the Pacific Ocean blocking us in that direction. And then you've got a bunch of, you know, uh, farmland and, and also Highway 101, um, you know, sort of blocking Santa Cruz Mountains to the south. So this is the fragmentation that occurs at a large scale. But then, you know, within the Santa Cruz Mountains, you know, within the habitat of, of these animals, you've got um, incursions of development and roads. Here we are looking down on the UC Santa Cruz campus, and the city of Santa Cruz. And you can see, you know, this is particularly where there's trees and buildings in them. This is another kind of habitat fragmentation that these animals have to sort of cope with at the scale of an individual home range. You know, so animals who live in the Santa Cruz Mountains often have housing development, roads, various forms of, you know, human impact on their, and within their home range, which they have to, you know, navigate in some way or another. Um, here's Highway 17. Um, and then, uh, you know, this fragmentation has lots of different kinds of impacts. Uh, one thing that happens is animals get injured. Uh, this is an animal 16M who was hit and dragged by a car on Highway 17, we're pretty sure, it removed about a square foot of skin from his hind rump. Somehow he was able to survive. Uh, here's a, a deer we got on one of our trail cameras, same kind of uh, injury. Um, but then, you know, most animals are not so lucky to survive that kind of thing. They usually die when they get hit by cars. Um, and then there's, you know, the sort of more insidious effects of, of habitat fragmentation. Here I'm showing um, a coyote um, and bobcat right next to the city of Santa Cruz, who are both suffering from mange. And, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more mange throughout the state really um, occurring in, 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 you know, small to large carnivore species like these guys. Um, most likely because of the sort of widespread use of rodenticides or rat poisons. So those poisons are very effective at, at killing rodents, but they don't kill them right away. And before they die, you know, they slow down and then they become susceptible to predation by these guys. These guys don't usually die from the poison itself, but it weakens their immune system. 
and then they become susceptible to mange and um, die from the mange. Um, there's also uh, in, impacts of fragmentation that occur at, at what I call a, um, at the landscape scale, where if, if populations are separated from each other, you start to get genetic defects. And these have been famously studied in, in uh, Florida and Everglades, where those animals are separated, you know, by hundreds of miles from other animals. And there you see all kinds of things like this famous kinked tail up here. Uh, you also see malformed sperm and, and low sperm counts. Uh, you see heart deformities, cryptocortism, which is where the testicles fail to descend. We're starting to see this kind of stuff in um, mountain lions in California as well, uh, and particularly outside of the LA area on the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, but that's the only place we've actually looked for it. Um, it could be that it's happening more widespread in California, but we won't know that for another uh, few years. Okay, so how do we go about studying these animals? Well, you know, they're incredibly elusive. They've got these huge home ranges. Males might have a you know, home range of 150 square kilometers. You know, it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack, right? Um, so we, we have a lot of tricks up our sleeve. We use a lot of trail cameras to do reconnaissance, figure out how these animals are moving through the landscape, where there might be animals that um, are uncolored and opportunities to become research animals. And then um, we use a couple techniques to, to catch the animals. Uh, one is we use these sort of oversized cage traps where um, if we do things right, they'll walk into the cage. And then the other is we use uh, hound dogs to um, uh, chase the animals up a tree. So if, if all goes well, uh, hounds will pick up the scent of their track and then uh, chase the animal up into the tree and then they'll start barking and that lets us know that they've got an animal in the tree and then we'll come come to the tree the mountain lion is you know usually looking around like this sometimes they go to sleep um and you know then we we shoot them with the dart in the butt and um we put a tracking collar on them we put an ear tag on them as a permanent identifier the tracking collar, um, we can drop off remotely to get our data back, um, but the ear tag will stay in so that if the animal lives beyond its collaring, we can still sometimes, you know, figure out what its ultimate fate was. Um, we also take a blood sample for genetic work. We take some hair that allows us to look at isotopes, which give us an indication, a sort of rough indication of diet and other interesting things like potential poisons in the environment. Um, we found mercury to be a, a relatively big deal in these coastal environments, for instance. Um, and then once they're collared, we can, you know, answer all kinds of interesting questions about their, their biology. Um, so for instance, you know, people ask, well, what do pumas eat? And um, pumas are an ambush predator, and uh, their preferred diet is really deer, uh, pretty much anywhere you go in, in the Northern Hemisphere. They're primarily feeding on deer, though they do feed on lots of other things. And um, uh, here's a, a, another video of them uh, chasing some various uh, smaller predators like coyotes, um, which they will occasionally kill and feed on, um, not so much in our study area, but in the Santa Monica's mountain, Santa Monica Mountains, for instance, they feed on quite a bit of coyotes. Um, here's a, a possum, which we find at their kill sites somewhat frequently. Uh, this possum is pretty badass, I have to say. Um, in any case, no idea what happened to that guy. Uh, and then here's a, a raccoon. Holy shit! Holy shit! That fucking happened. <laughs> it did. Holy um, shit! So that was a mountain lion uh, caught a raccoon. A mountain lion catching a raccoon right in front of this guy on his back porch. 
So, you know, if we look at the data, um, this is, you know, everything mountain lions eat. So they eat quite a, you know, smattering of, of different prey. Um, but mostly we see that they kill deer. And the next two big items are, are raccoons and, and house cats. Um, this is their prey items by, uh, by number. We look at it by, you know, biomass or the amount of meat they're getting from uh, each of these, then we can see that, you know, deer are really the main game in town. Um, I will note that, you know, goats are very much like deer. Uh, goats are basically a defenseless deer in the eyes of a mountain lion. And so they have a really hard time resisting uh, killing goats. Um, Unfortunately, this is the main way that mountain lions die in the Santa Cruz Mountains, is, is they kill someone's goat, and then, um, you know, the landowner can retaliate, get a depredation permit from CDFW, and um, kill the mountain lion. Okay, so, whoa, what happened? Sorry, somehow I've zoomed to the end of the talk. Don't look. Okay, so, wow. Sorry, my computer seems to be doing things on its own here. Okay, so another question people ask me is, you know, do mountain lions or pumas fear, uh, fear humans, fear people? Um, mountain lion, puma, cougar, catamount, panther, it's all the same animal. Um, they just have, they have the largest latitudinal range of any mammal. They go all the way from Southeast Alaska to, you know, the very Southern tip of Chile. And so they've picked up a lot of common names, uh, throughout. Um, but these are all the same animal. And if you look at this picture here, you know, this is my office on the UCSC campus and Here's a GPS location of one of our collared pumas, 36M, one summer evening. Here I am posing with the deer he killed with my office in the background, and there he is coming back again to feed that night. So, um, you know, if you ask whether they fear people, you might say, well, it seems like this guy might even have it in for me because I put a collar around his neck um, and he's stalking me. But we're scientists, and so we wanted to look at this experimentally. And so we designed an experiment where we put out um, uh, cameras attached to MP3 players, attached to speakers, and we played the sounds of either people talking or frogs croaking as a control at their kill sites. We saw how the animals reacted. So here's, a, here's one example. So here's the frogs. See, it doesn't do much. That's a, a deer carcass, by the way, underneath a bunch of redwood dust that he's used to cache it. And next we'll play the, the humans. Because the grand jury rendered a correct verdict. So, you know, there is his reaction with humans. You might recognize the voice as that of uh, Rush Limbaugh. Um, we played uh, partisans on the left, partisans on the right, non partisans, and uh, Pumas were completely non partisan in their fear of people. In fact, they almost always fled when we played people talking. So, this panel here on the left shows the percent of the trials where they fled upon hearing people, and you can see they almost always fled when they heard people. They almost never did when they heard frogs. And then there's a ecological and behavioral effect in that if they heard people talking, they're less likely to return. Um, and if they do return, it takes them longer to return than if they had heard frogs. So that's the behavioral effect. And then the ecological effect is that um, they spend less time feeding. So they're getting fewer calories um, from these deer after having heard a human voice out it. They feed for about half as long as they feed when 
they've heard frogs. And so um, if pumas are getting less food from these uh, kills that are sort of human influenced, if you will, then they presumably have to make that up by getting that food somewhere else. And so we looked at that by, um, we, we identified, you know, hundreds of, of kills that mountain lions made throughout our study area. And then we looked at the context of those kills. So some kills were, you know, close to people. And then other kills were, you know, quite far away from people. So if you look at this panel B here, this is this first kill site. Each of these gray dots is like a house. And this kill site here is, you know, quite far away from any houses. Um, and what we find is that if they're sort of close to people, then they'll spend, you know, the wee hours of the evening feeding at the kill, but then when humans are out and about, they, they move a few hundred meters away and they rest in, you know, a, a quiet place. But if they're out in the middle of nowhere with no human influence, then they just sort of stay at the kill feeding on and off throughout the day and night. And so that has an impact on their kill rates of deer, because if they're feeding less, they have to ramp up and kill more. And so we see that female pumas with more houses in their home ranges kill up to, you know, 50% more deer a year, up to 75 deer a year, where they have a lot of uh, houses in their home ranges, down to, you know, around 50 deer a year, where they um, live in, in more pristine areas. Okay, so, so that's what happens if there's people around, you know, kill sites, but we then wanted to know, okay, well, what if there's just sort of people in the forest? Um, how does that affect mountain lion behavior in general, not just around kill sites? And so we set up an experiment where we, um, where we had a grid, a one kilometer square grid of speakers with 25 speakers, each space 200 meters apart. Um, and we had one of these experimental grids in San Vicente and then another one in um, Midpen land, both of which were sort of close to humans. And so then we, we played on our speakers, we played, you know, a month of humans talking, followed by a month of frogs. The other one we did it sort of the reverse, a month of frogs, followed by a month of humans. And then we had, uh, cameras throughout the area looking at how smaller predators like bobcats, possums responded. We also had um, every animal, every mountain lion that used these two grids, we collared them and had the GPS sampling every five minutes so we could see, with, you know, you know, real detail how they moved in response to the grid. And then we wondered, you know, if, if, if uh, how, how the effect might cascade to the bottom of the food web, and so, or at least lower down in the food web. And so we trapped for small mammals as well to see how rodents would respond. And so this is an example of, of, of what this looked like. So here's our grid with our speakers, each of our speakers, and then, you can see when the control or the frogs are playing that Mount Lion kind of just walks through the grid and doesn't seem to care. But when the humans are playing on the speakers, Mount Lion kind of comes to the grid and then bounces off and sort of moves around it and goes on its way. So that's really what we found. We found that when humans were, voices were playing in the forest, mountain lions were much more likely to avoid the grid in general. If they did happen to go through the grid, they moved much more cautiously, just basically they slow down and move very, very slowly. And we had two ideas about how this might impact the smaller predators. The first was that, you know, mountain lions do eat these smaller predators. And so maybe they would feel more safety without mountain lions in the forest. But the other thing we know is that humans are by far the most lethal predator of of carnivores in general, not just big guys like mountain lions. So we thought maybe they they would also fear us. 
And then um, that's exactly what we found that all three of these smaller carnivores that were, you know, um, active in the forest all sort of showed a negative response to human voices. Um, bobcats became more nocturnal, skunks just reduced their activity overall, and possums um, uh, reduced their, their foraging activity. And then with the smaller predators sort of laying low, we found that the rodents actually sort of responded really positively. So deer mice doubled their home range sizes, um, and both mice and wood rats um, became much more active foraging. And so if we kind of look at a visual of how this uh, experimental manipulation of people in the forest uh, affects the, the food web, we see that when there's no people in the forest, you know, you've got these carnivores out and about doing their thing, and the small mammals or the rodents kind of, you know, moving very carefully in, in small ways. But then when you put people in the forest, even if they're just talking to each other, they're not shooting at things or anything, and all of a sudden the carnivores make themselves scarce, and the rodents sort of go on to have a field day. Okay, so moving on, um, you know, we've, we've shown that people cause this fear response in mountain lions. So, you know, how does that respond, how does that influence where they go on the landscape? Well, seemingly, you know, this would suggest that maybe that it doesn't really matter. Um, each one of these colors is an individual animal. And, um, you know, each dot is like, you know, separated by time and four hours. So this was a just a smattering of animals we had colored a few years ago. And I just show this to show that, you know, really anywhere in the Santa Cruz Mountains that you have natural vegetation and deer, you're gonna have mountain lions. But while it looks like they can be everywhere, they actually move in very specific ways. So here's this animal 36M coming into the west side of Santa Cruz. And they generally avoid urban areas, um, but um, the way they move is really interesting. They, they never like to be exposed. So if you look at this, you see all this grassland here you have to really work hard to find any dots in the grassland, right? They're almost always under cover of trees or shrubs. Um, here they are moving through the UCSC campus. And again, you know, they're never gonna be caught out in the open. They're almost always under cover. And um, this is, uh, the other thing that's true is that, um, this looks like, sorry, this looks like, you know, an animal is all over, there's mountain lions all over the UCSC campus, but this is just one individual's locations over a couple of years. So this is like, you know, three visits over a couple of years to the UCSC campus, right? So not much. And then um, all their movement occurs at night. They move very little during the day. And so, even if you wanted to see one of these guys, you know, moving through the forest, you know, you'd have to be out there at night. You'd have to pick the right day of the year they were there. You'd have to have your infrared camera. So that's why they're, they're so elusive and, and difficult to see. But sometimes they, they kind of veer off and they do enter urban areas. And really these are just mistakes. Um, this is an animal that, uh, approached Highway 85 from uh, the Almaden Quicksilver area. First, I thought, you know, if I zoomed in, I'd see it walking through down a creek or something like that. But, you know, there, there really doesn't appear to be any creek here. But it hit the edge of Highway 85, spent the night underneath, or sorry, the day, either underneath this person's boat or this tree right here. And then the next night, it walked back into open space. No one was ever the wiser. Uh, here's another example of um, an animal sort of veering off the natural path. This is our collar coming in from Germany, and then we put it out on an animal. 
around uh, San Vicente, big basin area. And this was a young male who was still with his mom. And you can see he's moving around in what looks like a sort of territorial home range. Then he leaves his mom and he, he disperses, which is when young animals leave their mom and go off on their own to find their own territory. And so he wanders through the Santa Cruz Mountains. He gets to uh, Highway 280, decides for some reason across 280 into Los Altos Hills, decides, hmm, maybe that's not urban enough for me. And he walks into downtown Mountain View. And he winds up on this corner at about 5 a.m. in the morning. Things are starting to get active. He says, oh shit. And he goes and he hides under this bush outside this apartment complex. And that's the bush that he's hiding behind. And he's there all day from like, you know, five in the morning to five or six o'clock at night. Um, and at a certain point, he makes a break for it. And uh, people become aware of it. The police are called out. They respond with, you know, a bunch of units and, and there's a helicopter and eventually they get him uh, trapped inside this uh, covered parking garage. And because it's Silicon Valley, everything's happening on Twitter. And so the Mountain View PD start um, tweeting about it. Possible mountain lion sighting, seen with a radio collar type around its neck. Do not approach, more info as we have it. And then this occurred at a time when uh, the law had recently changed to mandate local law enforcement to try to non-lethally remove these animals from urban areas. Um, but nobody had been trained in how to do that. And so a couple of these things happened where um, they asked us for our help in, you know, removing the animal. And so um, instead of emailing me or calling me, they tweeted at us at Santa Cruz Mountains trying to trying to reach you. We have a collared mountain lion, maybe related to your work. Um, I don't know. I'd, I've never been tweeted at before, and I wouldn't even know how to respond. So luckily, they found my email or my phone number, and, and they called us. But um, the tweeting went on, and, and the next thing the Mountain View police did is they created a hashtag for this event, MV Puma. And then all of a sudden, things blow up on Twitter. Julie Vasquez says, sheltered in place, and we have a hashtag. Exciting night in the Silicon Valley. And then Nancy writes, helicopter looking for a mountain lion in our neighborhood. So you start to get a sense for you know, what the scene is like there. And this is what it looked like when we got there. Uh, there was a whole bunch of press, and people. and um, But the cops did a great job of sort of blocking off the area where the mountain lion was. Um, and then, uh, you know, here's another tweet, Mount Lyons spotted in Mountain View, police there with guns drawn in Rangstor from California. Um, and then I like this tweet by Track Dang. He writes, Mountain View PD cornered Envy Puna beneath a car in an apartment complex. That's my complex and it's probably my car. And so then here's the mountain lion sort of cowering <laughs> beneath this minivan. And uh, wouldn't you know it, but all of a sudden this mountain lion pops up on Twitter with his own Twitter account. And he writes, this game warden guy has a weird looking gun. Why do you think I'm under the car? And you guys, they've got me surrounded. Um, so we were able to you know, safely anesthetize him and load him up in the back of our vehicle. And then we had this like four car sirened escort bringing us back into the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, where we released him. And then um, uh, this photo was taken of him on a game camera a couple of days later. And wouldn't you know it, but he's back out, back on Twitter. And he says, glad to be back out in the open spaces and soft hills. That city concrete is murder on the pause. Humans call me 46M, but my friends call me Rory. And then I love this tweet by Sam Wheatley, which sort of sums it up nicely. We should use the MV Puma hashtag to organize a block party. This is the most contact I've ever had with my neighbors. So, you know, fun night in the Silicon Valley, but 
you know, what it really illustrates quite well, I think, is that, um, you know, these animals are trying to get somewhere and they're having a really hard time doing that. And so there's a lack of what we call connectivity across the landscape, a lack of connections to neighboring mountain ranges where these animals can disperse to, um, reproduce, spread their genetics. Without that, our population is going to be in real trouble. So we teamed up with a, a group of scientists across the state who are collecting genetic samples and um, published this paper that was led by Holly Ernest and her lab at University of Wyoming, where we showed that um, there's actually quite a bit of what ecologists call population structure among these animals um, along the coast from San Francisco to the Mexican border. So where you see these different colors, those are really sort of different populations that are breeding with each other, but not adjacent ones. And there's no reason why you'd expect to see this structure naturally. You know, there's no reason why, why mountain lions from the Santa Cruz Mountains shouldn't be able to get to the Gabalin Range. You know, it's only a few hundred meters away. Um, but what there are separating these mountain ranges are pretty substantial roadways and, and development. And so um, uh, this has become a problem for these animals. And, and one way we know that is we can look at something called the effective population size, or NE. This is a concept from population genetics, but it essentially tells you the number of a breeding adults in your population. And for you know the long-term persistence of a of a species or population, you want to see an effective population size of about 500 to 1,000. But you know in these areas we've got you know five animals or 2.7 or you know in our case here in the Santa Cruz Mountains about 16 for the effective population size. That's just not enough to have the genetic variability that we need to maintain these populations in the long run. And so um, some nice work by John Benson and colleagues in the Santa Monica has shown that you know, we need at least one new migrant entering the population per generation. So you know one animal every two or three years that comes into the Santa Cruz Mountains from a neighboring mountain range and successfully reproduces. So how are we going to do that? Well, we need to mitigate, improve the connectivity in our, 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 our area. Um, so there's three regions that are of concern. There's the Highway 17, then there's the Highway 101 where it crosses the Coyote Valley and, you know, around Aromas and San Juan Batista. And so to look at connectivity, we've um, um, done a lot of data collection and modeling. Um, and along Highway 17, our models and data suggest that there's two really important pinch points. That's um, where the spillway of the Lexington Reservoir is up here and around where the Laurel Curve is down here on this side of the summit. And, um, you know, those are, this, these are places where you know, like the land trust has been protecting land on both sides of the highway. Caltrans is now going to put a tunnel underneath Highway 17. And then in this area, you have Midpen and Post doing a lot of um, conservation work and uh, getting a tunnel, uh, I think eventually will get built there as well. Um, so if we move over to the uh, Coyote Valley, then what we can see is that here we are in space again, looking at the Santa Cruz Mountains. And each one of these colors is the track of a mountain lion that we colored when he was young and male. <laughs> and um, what you can see is these animals, they're, they're moving around a lot, right? And they're trying to find a way to get to some neighboring mountain range. And you can see they, they keep striking out, right? They, they go north, they get nothing, they go east, they get nothing. And they're, they're, not, uh, they're not able to get across the Coyote Valley right now because the habitat and, and uh, crossing structures against the highway aren't very, aren't very good, similarly in the south. 
So if we zoom into this area, um, you know, this is the closest one of our dispersal cats got. Um, and this is the area of interest. And so to get a better idea of, of what might be going on in there for wildlife, we collared some bobcats as well. Bobcats are like little mountain lions, except because they're littler and smaller, they have smaller home ranges. Uh, they're more dense on the landscape and they can sort of tell us a little bit about how a mountain lion might move through an area um, with a bit more replication. And so we did the same thing where we trap these animals and put tracking collars on them. But instead of generally sampling every four hours, we were sampling every five minutes the animals moved. And this resulted in, you know, 20 plus animals. This is the the movement paths of those animals. And so this orange, these orange lines are the movement paths of, of 20 plus bobcats in the Coyote Valley. And to orient you, this, this white line here is the Highway 101. And um, this brown line here is Monterey Road. And so what you can see is that there's, the connectivity actually across the 101 isn't bad. This Monterey Road is a real barrier to connectivity. And there's just this one spot here where animals can sometimes get through. And it's not a great spot either. It's a culvert that gets clogged, um, resulting in a lot of the animals trying to go over the roadway and they get, they get run over often. And so um, this is an area where um, Post and others are doing a lot of work to um, conserve land in the Santa Coyote Valley and then restore it with appropriate vegetation that would allow for more wildlife movement and then work with Caltrans to try to mitigate the impact of this road, these roads and make them more permeable to wildlife movement. And then if we look at the southern Santa Cruz Mountains then we see that the same problem where this is a mountain line. He got all the way to 101 here and then his collar stopped working almost surely because he got hit by a car and the collar got smashed. So again, we collared a bunch of bobcats and a single fox in this area. What you can see is that none of them are getting across the 101. And so um, this is another area where the, the land trust has been acquiring land. They just acquired this big, um, property to the south of the 101 called the Rocks Ranch and the Gavilan. And now that gives them the ammunition to work with Caltrans to try to, you know, make a tunnel or wildlife bridge here to restore connectivity. So um, that's all I have prepared to talk with you today. I'd be more than happy to take questions and, you know, invite you to visit our um, our webpage, santacruzpumas.org. We've got um, uh, a bunch of our publications up there, as well as a, a puma tracker where you can uh, see where these tracked animals are going in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, I am um, curious. I know one of the issues you've just been highlighting is that land trusts can uh, work on corridor connections and wildlife corridors with tunnels, underpasses through highways. But I'm curious if you have guidance for other things that you'd like to see groups like Semper Virens doing. Um, every time I listen to you, I worry that we aren't doing enough because although we have a large, uh, we've had many sightings of mountain lions on many of our properties, um, including San Vicente, um, I worry that as we open some of those properties to public access and recreation, that we are countering the benefits of the habitat protection we've provided thus far. So anyway, I just wonder if you have any um, suggestions for organizations like ours about things that we can be doing to better support these, these mountain lion populations. Yeah, that's a great question, Sarah. And I'd, I'd say that... Um... You know, the, one of the things that we have some indications of, but by far is not settled science yet, is, you know, what are the impacts of recreation on 
these animals and, and other species. And I think this is becoming particularly poignant in the Santa Cruz Mountains where, you know, more and more of properties that used to be private and, and, and private usually means very low human impact on a regular basis. Um, sure, there might be logging, but that would be sort of like an intense impact over a very short period of time and then very little impact. Uh, you transition to recreation, which is sort of this like constant impact all the time, albeit non-lethal, right? Um, and so I'd say the, the short answer is, is we don't really know what the impacts of recreation are yet, although we do have, you know, suggestions like these experiments that show that, you know, just by having people talking in the forest cause these animals to like scoot out of there. Um, will they become habituated and then not worry about people, um, which could be a good thing, or maybe it's a bad thing if they're not worried about people and they start jumping on people more, you know, these yeah. are sort of, uh, I think important questions that we need to be continuing to ask. And so I guess I'd, I'd say, you know, what can you do if you're opening up an area for, for, for recreation is, you know, do some monitoring before you open it up, continue to monitor afterwards. Um, if you see significant changes, pull back a little bit um, and try to use a science-based approach to, you know, managing your own. Yeah, and we've, we've been trying to do that. You, you and your colleagues have been working with us to try to sure. establish baseline data before the, before the properties open, but I... I worry about it. And I think one of the one of the most powerful things I've heard you say on this subject, and you just alluded to it a bit just now, is that the large uh, acreage in our region owned by the timber companies are some of the best wildlife habitat, which runs very counter to what you would sort of intuitively think. And I think of all these uh, protected lands that Semper Virens and others have put into state park hands um, but of course, those are places that are filled with visitors and filled with people. And so um, it's a conundrum. <laughs> um, well, the other question I had for you is, you know, I think people are hearing more about mountain lions having interactions with urban areas, as you just cited. And anecdotally, you know, I feel like everybody I know has some story they've heard about a mountain lion showing up in a parking lot. And maybe that's just anecdotal. Um, but at the same time, that Central Coast population of mountain lions was just listed by the state as a threatened species. And I wonder if you could speak to the, our audience a bit about how it is that we're both hearing more and seeing more interaction with mountain lions. At the same time, we're also hearing that their population is threatened and, um, and diminishing. Yeah, great, great question. So the, the threat is so 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 the the threatened status is about their genetics more than it is about their numbers you know their numbers in the santa cruz mountains right now are you know we don't know exactly how many they are but from what we can sort of estimate so far they seem to be in line with what you would expect for habitat like the santa cruz mountains what i worry about really is the level of genetic diversity, which is super low. And that makes them super vulnerable. If, if, if some kind of disease comes in, then they all react to the disease in the same way. And, you know, the population could, could blink out very quickly. And so, are you, I'm uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't interrupt I'm you. Good. Well, I was just going to ask, following on that, are you and your colleagues talking at all about any purposeful mixing of the populations to try to increase the diversity of the, of the individual populations? You know, are yeah, you looking at moving, moving mountain lines from the Sierra Nevada into Santa Cruz Mountains just to facilitate more diversity, given that these um, barriers, the highways, the development that you were talking about have really made the Santa Cruz Mountains an island unto themselves. Yeah, so you know, I would I would much prefer to see that be done by restoring connectivity than by moving animals around. You know, you start moving animals around, 
then, uh, you know, you basically need to make a commitment to doing that, you know, forever into the future. Yeah, it's not uh, a long-term future, solution. Future generations may not be interested in moving animals around anymore. Yeah. Um, but you restore that connectivity and the animals will do it for you. And you have this less kind of like zoo management kind of situation and more just a natural process occurring. And yeah. so, you know, in terms of having healthy ecosystems, to me, that would be the much preferable route to take. Yeah. Well, and speaking of healthy ecosystems, this audience knows and you know that we just went through a catastrophic uh, and very large wildfire last summer. Um, I'm nervous about this year's wildfire season. And we're also in a period of drought, or at least the first couple of years of drought. And I just wondered, what do we know about the impacts that either of those issues has on our region's mountain lion population? Do we know? Um, no, very little. Um, you know, we, at any one point in time, we have, you know, say 10 animals with tracking collars on them. And, uh, you know, as we did during the, the big fire last year, um, three of those animals live sort of at the edge of the fire. And, um, you know, there's nothing dramatic about how their movement changed or any of anything like that post-fire. Uh, we don't see any sort of dramatic changes to the population as we can observe, you know, through camera data or anything like that. So, um, you know, the short answer is we don't know because uh, we haven't like analyzed any data before and post-fire, but the, um, I guess a longer answer would be that we are actually looking at the effects of fire on mountain lions across the state of California, where we're pooling data with studies, you know, from San Diego all the way north to um, where each, where there's lots of small sample sizes of animals encountering fire, but then pooled together as a bigger sample size. And so we'll be able to understand that better. Sorry, kind of jumbled answer. No, that's okay. I'm just curious um, whether you think, whether your suspicions are that, I mean, I think I'm hearing you say you don't have early evidence indicating that the population was wiped out by the fire or anything like that. It sounds like the animals are are able to move fast enough they could get out of its way. But I'm curious whether post-fire, some of the places that had been, say, denning habitat, no longer become viable, or, or is that, do we not, um, is that not the case? Do, do we think that an animal's just as likely to go back to an area that's been burned and still find it habitable? Or do we even know? Yeah, so, um... You know, the really clear examples are from like Southern California where you have chaparral that burns and it yeah. goes from this, you know, landscape with 3D vegetation structure to a 2D landscape where nothing's taller than that. Yeah. Mountain lions aren't going to live in that because yeah. they, they really do need cover. Um, around here, though, the way our landscape burns, you know, San Vicente, for instance, you know, some of the areas are burnt, some of the sort of lower lying areas aren't as much, you know, closer to the creeks. Um, you know, they'll continue to use that mosaic of habitat probably differently than they did before, but they'll still use it. Um, you know, some of the more moonscapey areas in a place like Big Basin, you know, they're probably not going to go back in there until, you know, there's deer in there again. But yeah. as soon as there's deer back in there, they'll mountain lions will be there. Yeah. Okay. I see we're running short on time. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Matt Schaefer, who's going to take a few questions uh, from the audience and share them with us. Thank you, Chris. Thanks so much for this. And um, you've answered a fair number of questions that have come in. There's a couple that are, uh, that are, um, that are very common that we've gotten regarding the, particularly regarding the number of mountain lions. You probably get this a lot. Um, we sometimes hear that there are 40 left in the Santa Cruz Mountains or similar numbers. There are some that are collared and some that are uncollared. 
Um, one person notes that they've seen five uncolored pumas in their neighborhood. <laughs> uh, can you say a little bit about what numbers we should be thinking about in terms of population in the Santa Cruz Mountains area and um, how you get to that number? Yeah, so, you know, pretty typical numbers that you see for mountain lions in parts of the West um, with sort of similar levels of productivity, say, would be like in the range of three to five mountain lions per 100 square kilometers. Wow. Um, I think that we're probably around in line with those numbers, um, which would, you know, put our population in the Santa Cruz Mountains, you know, somewhere in the like 50 to 60 animal range. Um, to really know, you'd have to count them. And well, you can't really count mountain lions. You can do, uh, you can sort of statistically estimate them by putting out grids of cameras, um, seeing where you spot animals, um, and then if some of those animals are individually identifiable because like they have collars on them, for instance, then you can use some statistics that get you to a rough answer. And we're in the process of doing that. But my guess is that it will be somewhere in that neighborhood of three to five animals per hundred square kilometers. Thank you so much. That's a really helpful way of thinking about it. A um, couple other questions. Um, what should somebody do if they spot a mountain lion where they think a mountain lion shouldn't be? Um, well, I guess the first question would be to like question if you really believe they shouldn't be there. So, you know, mountain lions are gonna be anywhere there's natural vegetation and deer. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then I guess, you know, if you're walking in downtown San Francisco and you see a mountain lion, um, then, you know, I would, I would uh, you know, contact the police or something, or, you know, even better, CDFW, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. If you're on the, like, you know, western edge of Santa Cruz and uh, you see a mountain lion walking by your porch at night, um, you know, I guess just feel lucky to have seen one, but, um, it's not, it's, mountain lions don't prefer to be there. They, they spend way more of their time in the open space, but they do do that because there's lots of deer and there's lots of raccoon in these environments. And so they'll, they'll come in there to, to feed. Um, so that's not so unusual. Tara, do you want to uh, wrap things up? Yeah, well, I have one very quick last question. We have, I'll do a, I'll do like they do in NPR. We have about a minute left, Chris. Um, what do we do if we see one on the trail? Which is what I always use to uh, warn my kids to stay close to me and not get too far ahead of me on the trail as I threaten them that they'll see a, a mountain lion. But what if we do actually see a mountain lion? Yeah, so if you've got, small kids, I would make sure that they're like close to you. Um, you know, the conventional wisdom is to like make yourself look big and stare it down and make lots of noise. Um, there was a study at UC Davis that looked at this. They looked at all the human mountain lion interactions and they looked at what did the human do and then what was the outcome. And um, if people ran, they were less likely to get attacked. But if they got attacked, they were more likely to die. <laughs> so, you know, that doesn't, science doesn't really provide a good answer. Um, I think the conventional wisdom is still probably the way to go, you know, make yourself look threatening and, um, yeah. Unless, unless, of course, you're with a big group and you know you're faster than the other people in the group. <laughs> That's a different scenario then, yeah. All right, well, thank you, Chris. And thank you for all you do to support conservation in our region. You're a real champion, not only for these animals, but for their habitat. Um, so thank you. And thanks to our audience. I wanna invite you all to join us next month 
where we have a very different topic. We're going to be joined by Professor Suzanne Samar, uh, who's the author of Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest. And she has been writing about and thinking about what she calls the secret lives of trees, which is really about how different trees in a forest communicate with each other in ways that we hadn't known about till relatively recently. So join us then. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye.